Uh, welcome and thank everybody for joining us from around the country for this week's Pro Perspective, uh, the Insider's Guide to All Things CRE. I'm your host, really your co-host today, Matt Kors, um, work as the West Coast Regional Director at Crexy by day and, and really by night I, I moonlight on the Pro Perspective and I haven't done one, uh, hosted it in, in a couple weeks, so I'm, I'm excited for today. We're zoomed in with Greg Margatich and Norman Dong uh, in a discussion about federal real estate trends. So I think after last night um, with what most people watched on TV, it's, it's a pretty good uh, topic of conversation today. Uh, I'll do a quick intro and then we can get into the slideshow. So Norm, I'll begin with you. I'm currently Managing Director at FT, FD Stonewater, a real estate brokerage investment and development firm focusing on federal, state, and commercial properties. Uh, but previously the former commissioner of public building services for the u.s general service administration the gsa uh, managing a nationwide asset management design construction leasing building management and disposal of approximately 374 million square feet of government owned and leased space that is a lot of space um, and then before that what i thought was pretty interesting uh, you served as the chief financial officer for the federal emergency management agency from 08 to 12. Uh, so I, I feel as though that's very interesting to hear about how today maybe is being handled similarly or different uh, in your opinion so definitely thank you for joining today we're excited Glad and greg margatich no, yeah, we, we, we're going to have some fun today I, I know i have a lot of questions so <laughs> uh, we're going to have some fun and, and Greg Margatich, president of the Margatich Group, uh, subsidiary Margatich Real Estate and Development, which was founded in 1977, a commercial real estate investment transaction and advisory company. Greg has vast experience specializing in commercial real estate investments of, of all product types, uh, but specifically a concentration and acquisition and disposition of government lease properties located throughout the United States. And Greg and Norm, you're both um, on the board uh, with the, Fed, the National Federal Development Association, the NFDA, um, which is a trade association uh, representing organizations and individuals that provide real estate services to the land holding agencies of the U US, the United States government at the state and local municipalities. Um, I will um, basically more or less pause here because I'll let you guys explain uh, the NFDA in greater detail. Um, I'm not going to lie. I am. This is unfamiliar territory for myself, but I'm very excited to learn more about this, uh, especially with just what's going on in the world today. Uh, and last, before I kick it off um, to, to you all, a quick logistics reminder for our viewers: uh, there's a Q&A box and a chat feature. If you can ask questions in the Q&A box, we're going to try to get to them um, throughout the show as quickly as we can. So, let's get the conversation started. Yeah, happy to do it, Matt. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to Crexy. Absolutely. Uh, welcome, everybody. And um, I think it's going to be a pretty informative um, 45 minutes or what have you uh, regarding government lease properties throughout the United States. It's a, it's a kind of a unique sector, if you will. There's, um, there's a lot of brokers and principals and investment sales folks um, that are in the industry that might not know a lot about government lease properties throughout the country. So, um, I hope that uh, this is informative and that uh, engenders a little bit more interest in this space, if you will. I'm really happy to be joined by my colleague and federal board member, Norm Dong. And uh, we're real pleased to be here and share diverse and multifaceted aspects of government lease properties and how the government and the private sector work together to achieve the needs and services of the government. So, uh, what, you know, briefly with regard to National Federal Development Association, it was founded in 2009. It's a national trade association really having everything to do with government lease properties. Our website is nfda.us. So peruse that to learn more information. Uh, it's not nfda.com. So please make a note if you happen to <laughs> bounce on that website, you'll be surprised. It's a national funeral. The Directors Association. So, yeah, uh, forget that one for now. Um, anyway, so uh, the the National uh, Federal Development Association it concentrates primarily, I suppose, on federal government, but also state, city, county, and local. And association members and stakeholders include a network of private industry individuals and companies that include brokers that focus in investment sales or leasing, 
developers, lenders, service pro providers, and many other disciplines. The, the association provides what I think is a unique consolidated voice from association members and private industry to federal agencies and congressional members on matters relating to lease acquisition, build a suit, construction, identification and disposition of surplus properties, and all matters uh, related to the federal process and, per and procedures. We have eight chapters throughout the United States, so we reach out to local um, areas to um, introduce local people as opposed to our national conference, which is always held in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> the chapters are Atlanta, Boston, New York, Chicago, Denver, Washington, D.C., Sacramento, San Francisco, and Philadelphia. So to learn more about NFDA, get on the website. We have our national conference this October 20th and 21st. This year will be our first ever virtual. You can get on the website for more details and to register. What you're gonna hear from and who you're gonna hear from um, are Dan Matthews, who is the GSA Commissioner of Public Building Services uh, that, that uh, Norm, pardon me, was the former act, uh, commissioner and John Thomas, acting assistant commissioner, Tony Costa, the deputy executive director, Department of Veterans Affairs in office and construction and facilities. Management, leasing and industry leaders will be participating. So with that, um, I think we can move on to the first slide and um, discuss our first topic, which is the scope of federal real estate activity. So to give you a, a sense of this, you can see just by the, the slide that the federal agency occupies more than 267,000 buildings covering more than 1.1 billion square feet of space. GSA manages over 8,000 leases costing more than $5.7 billion each year. And there's another 50 agencies within the federal government that have what they call le uh, independent leasing authority, which allows them to directly deal with developers or property owners in securing space, uh, as opposed to going through GSA. So um, I think the next topic, uh, Norm, are you gonna take that? Yeah, let me just I, pick I up. I was gonna say, you did an enormous job handling all this scope and uh, an incredible, square footage of space and the cost of the federal government. So my accolades. Well, thanks, Greg. Um, and we'll go to the next slide, but I think the headline from this current slide is that the federal government has a vast portfolio of owned and leased space, which up until 2012 followed a path of continuous expansion. So Matt, you actually talked about my experience as the chief financial officer at FEMA. And I think about 10 years ago, attitudes towards federal real estate and spending on federal real estate started to change. And I think there was a growing recognition to that excess spending on real estate comes at the expense of more mission critical activities. So about 10 years ago, uh, there was this growing uh, objective across the federal government to spend less on federal real estate and more on agency mission. And if you look at any given administrative budget within any given agency, spending on real estate and facilities is often the second biggest line item after spending on personnel and staffing costs. So I think about 10 years ago, people were kind of recognizing that trade-off between, you know, administrative spending, which includes real estate, and other more mission-focused activities, recognizing that, okay, we're not gonna be living in this era of increasing spending forever. Sooner or later, we're gonna to have to tighten our belts and what do you wanna trade off as you've gotta make some tough spending decisions. So what we've seen over the past decade is a series of policy changes that change the trajectory of federal real estate over the past decade. And I would say the watershed moment was back in 2012 when OMB, I was at OMB at the time, issued the government-wide freeze the footprint guidance. And it was an effort to curtail what I said before was an expanding federal footprint. And it required agencies to lock in at their 
existing square footage using 2012 as the baseline. And the thinking there was, okay, let's just kind of stop the growth. You're locked in at your 2012 levels. And yeah, you can add space, but if you need to add space for a new facility or a new mission function, you need to find a corresponding offset. So it was de designed to be kind of net neutral in terms of the growth of the federal footprint from 2012 going forward. So a couple years later, uh, the federal government decided to double down on that concept and said, okay, it's not enough just to freeze the footprint. We got to roll things back and we got to reduce spending. So in 2015, what you saw was the reduce the footprint policy coming out of OMB, which now required a reduction from each agency in terms of their real estate footprint. And agencies were required to establish reduction targets. It was a very public process where those targets were tracked online and there was a lot of transparency in terms of agency progress. So there was a lot of pressure on agencies to skinny down their real estate consumption. Uh, 2016 uh, was a step further taken by the Congress when they passed the Federal Asset Sale and Transfer Act and the headline there was that, okay, the government has a lot of vacant and underutilized space and traditionally has done a really poor job in terms of unloading that space and reducing the spending associated with that space. So this was kind of a kick in the pants uh, by Congress to the administration to say, look, you need to do more. And it established an independent board and it established very specific targets for reduction going forward. So it just kind of continued on this, this drumbeat of footprint reduction. And then finally, you know, it's important to note that over the past decade, this whole notion of reducing the federal footprint and spending less on federal real estate has really been kind of a bipartisan effort shared by both Democrats and Republicans. And more recently, as you look at the current administration, they're continuing this path uh, most notably with the GSA lease cost avoidance program, where they've set a very specific target. I think it's close to about $5 billion in lease cost savings that they want to achieve through 2023. So again, whether you're Republican or a Democrat, this is one of the few areas where folks seem to agree that the federal government should be doing a better job in terms of reducing its footprint and reducing its spending. So let's shift to the next slide. And let's talk about the pandemic for a moment and consider the impact on federal real estate. And I think history is important here. And we can look back at previous, what I'll call shocks to the system to see where things may be headed in the future. And I think two important examples are the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, as well as the financial collapse of 2008 and 2009. And there are a couple important things to consider. First is after each of those significant events, you saw a dramatic increase in federal spending. So after 9-11, for example, the Department of Homeland Security was stood up, other agencies that contributed and supported to the national security function, they also saw a significant plus up in their budgets. So you're seeing spending increase significantly after that major event. You know, fast forward to 2008 and 2009 when you saw the economy collapse. You know, what you saw was at the, as the economy was losing steam, the federal government stepped in to provide a boost to spending uh, and to the economy. And you saw that the, there was the trillion dollar stimulus package, uh, which was designed to kind of jumpstart the economy. And at that time, you saw a record 24.4%, federal spending represented 24.4% of gross domestic product. So again, after 9-11, after the economic collapse of 2008, you're seeing a significant boost in federal spending. So then let's translate that to, to real estate. And let me explain this chart for a second. Uh, you've got the blue bars, which represent the GSA leased inventory across the country. And you can see the, the trend since 2000. 
And then you've got the blue line, which is more specifically focused on the national capital region here in Washington, D.C., where there's a significant amount of that federal leasing activity. But the point here is that, you know, GSA leases uh, properties all across the country, not just here in Washington, D.C. And what you see is, okay, as federal spending increased after 2001, as federal in spending increased after 2008, 2009, guess what? The federal real estate footprint also expanded. And I think the logic is clear, is you're kind of expanding government capacity and you're you know, enhancing functions and you know, doing more. You're going to need space and facilities to accommodate those additional uh, activities. So it, there's a logic here in terms of, okay, as federal spending increases, you should expect to see a corresponding increase in the federal real estate footprint as well. So, you know, that's 2001, that's 2008. The question becomes, all right, with this pandemic, what do we expect to see uh, both in terms of federal spending and federal real estate? And I think what we're seeing, at least as it relates to federal spending is past maybe prologue once again. Uh, let's shift to the next slide. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about federal spending this year. First, I wanted to note that today is September 30th. It is the last day of the federal fiscal year. And I think we've reached a milestone here where during FY 2020, federal spending for the first time ever eclipsed $6 trillion. And that doesn't even include the spending for this month. So for the 11 months uh, ending in, in August, spending surpassed the $6 trillion mark, which it has never done before. So, and I think part of that was the impact of the 2.3 fiscal, the $2.3 trillion fiscal stimulus package that was passed, I think it was in April, uh, and that was designed to kind of uh, boost the economy and to help the federal government respond to the pandemic. And as you see from the bullets here, this gives you a sense of where those dollars were going. It was tax relief, it was loans and grants for small businesses, uh, but it was also economic assistance for individuals as well. Um, but then if you go to the next slide, what you also see is that, okay, in addition to the, the individual assistance and the tax relief that went directly to uh, people across the country, you saw federal agencies get a significant shot in the arm in terms of uh, spending levels. And you know, part of this has been to uh, enhance the public health infrastructure to respond to the pandemic. So what you're seeing on this pie chart here, this shows the relative distribution of that $340 billion in federal agencies funding. You can see that HHS uh, in the green uh, gets the lion's share because when you think about whether it's the CDC or whether it's NIH, you know, those are our public health functions within the federal government. And there was this effort to kind of boost their capacity to respond not just to this pandemic, but to future events as well. Norm, can I just uh, mention something? Uh, you were referring to some acronyms for these agencies, and there might be some many folks, perhaps who don't know, that might not know what those stand for. So, yeah, yeah. Might want Center to for Disease Control. You've probably seen a lot about them in the news, as well as NIH, the National Institutes of Health. So, good point, Greg. And HHS is health. Is, Department uh, of Health and Human Services. Right, gotcha, okay. Okay, so a couple other things real quick on this chart. It's not just Health and Human Services that's getting the boost. It's also, also other agencies that you may not have realized play some supporting role in the public health function, whether it's the Department of Agriculture, which you see in that dark blue, navy blue wedge, or the Veterans Administration, which you see in kind of that reddish burgundy slice on the pie as well. So across the board, number of agencies are getting a boost in funding to help respond to the pandemic. So let's go to the last slide and then we can open it up for some questions and conversation. And I think the key question here is, all right, where will things go? 
uh, moving forward. And what we've seen is there are a lot of factors in play here, at play here, and there's kind of a push-pull uh, across these different factors. And, you know, things that would be on the plus side in terms of expanding the federal real estate footprint was, okay, we talked about past being prologue, and in previous historical events, you saw an expansion of the federal footprint as federal spending increased. Um, but then also what you're seeing right now is kind of a rethinking or reconsideration of the open office concept. And even though we've had a decade of efforts to uh, improve space utilization and to pack more people into uh, federal owned and leased space, what you're saying now is, wait a minute, do I want to be sitting two feet away from the person next to me and you know, should we be spreading out a little bit more? So I think there is some thought to de-densifying the federal workplace after a decade of you know, dramatically improving spatialization. So I think those are two factors that kind of are on the expansive side, but then you gotta look to see those other factors in terms of you know, what might pull it in the other direction. And I think one factor is the telework proof of concept that we've seen, not just at the federal level, but also at the state and local level, that we've never seen before, or everybody has been working from home. Uh, and it, I think we've been able to prove to ourselves that, okay, you know, we can do this if we have to. It may not be ideal, but we can do this. And, you know, it kind of opened some eyes in terms of, all right, how much space will we need going forward, given that folks have been working from home since March? So I think it's a question that's still being debated. Um, and then, you know, the last thing to consider is if you go back to that chart, Patty, go back two slides to the chart. One more, one, there we go. Go back to this chart. In past events, whether it was September 11th or whether it was the economic crisis of 2008, 2009, you didn't have a dramatic reduction of the federal footprint that had been underway for a number of years. So if you look at the second half of this chart here since 2013 or so, you're starting to see a drop in the overall federal leased inventory. And you see that with the blue bar, which represents the GSA leased inventory nationwide. You're seeing a much more dramatic drop in that blue line, which represents the federal lease inventory here in the national capital region. So I think slightly different factor this time in terms of you have this dramatic push that has been underway for a number of years to reduce the footprint. The question is, how is that going to be offset or you know, balanced by some of those other factors that we talked about? So just jumping back to the last slide, Patty, uh, those are some of the issues that folks are thinking about now, I would say that the jury's still out as GSA and its tenant agencies are considering these various factors on their current and future space requirements. And again, it's not just at the federal level, but it's also at the state and local level as well. So we'll pause here and Matt, I'll turn it back to you to continue us through the conversation. Yeah, that. Thank you uh, both for presenting that. That's um, that opens my eyes up to a lot of what I was not uh, familiar with prior to. So I, I think that's a good a good portion for us to to jump into. I mean, the first question on my mind, and it maybe takes a step back, is just how do how do government entities go about acquiring their commercial real estate, whether that be a lease or a, a purchase, and and what kind of you know, and that might be a big question to unpack there. But uh, well, how have you guys seen over the years they, they go about these types of things, these types of decisions and whatnot? Um, well, let me address the first part. I think, uh, Norm, you could discuss how the government acquires space in terms of ownership or, you know, self-development. But um, from the, the, the private sector seeking to win an award for a government lease, the government, you know, GSA or any other local agency typically sends out, uh, you know, a request for a, a site or a, or a uh, lease space that, that they have and want to lease to the government. So there's a process that you go through. Most times there is um, a leasing broker that represents ownership 
And then there's a, a, actually a contract with several uh, of the significant firms in the country that uh, represent the, the government in negotiations to acquire that space. So it does take some knowledge and understanding. These leases are, are very unique. For the most part, they're all fully service gross. There's very few leases that I'm aware of that um, are net, double net, triple net. The government wa doesn't want to be involved in the operations. They don't want to have to worry about providing services. They just want to be able to use the facilities and not have to worry about any kinds of operations or expenses in that regard. Um, most, most of the leases, um, particularly renewals or smaller spaces, tend, tend to be you know, in the under 10,000 square foot range, um, but they go up into the hundreds of thousands. Mostly those are, are build a suit kind of arrangements for Veterans Affairs, FBI, or certainly other, other agencies. So um, it's just a matter of getting into the, the, the system, understanding more about how these properties are, are utilized by the government, how, how they proceed with the leasing of it. And I would suggest reaching out to the brokers that do this for a living, if you will. Um, and of course you can visit the NFDA website, learn more about it. There's various articles to uh, learn more about the space. Uh, but when it comes to non-lease space the government you know secures in one way or another builds um, on their own or what have you um, norm most definitely is most equipped to to be able to explain how that works yeah and i think what we're seeing not just at the federal level but also at the state and local level is that most governments have a mix of government owned and government leased facilities in their real estate portfolio and if you look at the federal level right now it's about 50 50 in terms of the mix and there are several factors that play into the decision of whether the government should own or lease the facility. One is the nature of the facility. So if you've got something that's inherently governmental and you know you're going to be there forever, let's take a courthouse for example, more generally that is something that is government owned. Whereas if you've got more of a generalized function, let's say a call center, that is, that is probably better for a lease, particularly if that is not a long-term or an inherently governmental uh, function. I think the expected length of the tenancy is also uh, an important factor, but what we've seen most recently and most significantly is its availability of funds. And you know, the key question is, what's the capital budget that you have for acquisition, construction, as well as repairs? Uh, what's your operating budget for operations and maintenance? And what we've seen is that as governments see their capital budgets being squeezed tighter and tighter, they still need that facility. So, you know, an alternative, a very viable alternative has been private development solutions to be able to have a lease option for that space. You know, I was, I was going to ask this question next, but it actually just came in uh, from someone in the audience and, and it's, um, from Tarina, she asks, for real estate investors, would a good strategy be to target a certain area that would attract the federal government or any government at that, at that matter? If, if you're looking to have them as a tenant, is there a specific strategy you could maybe do? And, and how would that kind of pull into the, I guess, well, I guess it would, I would say their, their portfolio strategy and how they own? Uh, well, in terms of leasing, the, the government specifies uh, quite specifically, if you will, as to what their, their needs, their requirements are, and you know, a geographical area to, to locate in. And so those that are paying attention, that are searching for, for these needs through BizOps, or I think there's a new name for it now, they can discover what the government has a need for in the local area uh, for a lease. And that's, that's basically how they, fi they find out for the most part, or if they're already in the industry, they might be aware of an agency that has a particular need in their area. Uh, so, so that's kind of the geographic area that, that they, they move to, and it's a local specified area um, it based, it, based on where their needs are, where they need to be located. Some, some are in primary markets, secondary markets, tertiary markets, just depends on, on the agency. I think part of this also is not just looking to see what's advertised, but looking upstream to get a better understanding of the government function, 
and trends that are driving the government demand for space at an agency by agency level. And being able to get ahead of the curve to understand what those trends would suggest, for example. So, you know, let's just take um, at the state level, what we're seeing is a lot of activity in public safety, uh, as well as in human services, uh, particularly in the Sun Belt areas. And so I think part of it is as you get a deeper understanding of government functions and as you get a deeper understanding of agency mission and how those agency mission how that agency mission changes and evolves over time and to overlay kind of like the geographic uh, elements and the demographics on all of that that kind of gives you a better sense of where you'll see uh, changes in activity and where you'll see future potential demand interesting okay and that's that's basically how it goes with the, the difference from federal versus state and probably just what agencies are doing lo located in each area is that is that correct is that a correct statement there um talk a little bit more about that i'm not sure i'm following your question well i guess you know if if you're looking at like a and it get, so sam just asked this question i was kind of like going to go off that but is, is there a trend at like the federal or state level on what what they may be if they're going to be selling their buildings instead of leasing their buildings, I guess, let me say that that was a question that Sam asked that they're selling their buildings versus leasing. And I was just going to ask like how it would differ at the federal or state level. Would that be if there's agencies operating in under both or if it's going to be, you know, differ by, by agency, et cetera. Uh, the consumption of space and how much space they're using, I think it varies by function. So let's just look okay. at the federal level. For example, you've seen, uh, in this administration, you know, a dramatic uh, increase in terms of an emphasis on national security. So if you kind of look across the different agencies uh, at the federal level, you'll see, and you kind of follow their budgets, you can see who's getting increases. And then as we were talking about before, you can oh, okay. apply that back to, you know, potential increases in the footprint. Okay, I see. And then if they are going to be selling their buildings instead of leasing or I guess how so they can capitalize on the sale and the lease instead is what he asked would there be a difference there on what they're looking to do or that kind of goes back to your initial point if it's a courthouse they're there for life if it's a call center that's going to be specific on a case-by-case -case kind of yeah I think the federal government the lens that they've used traditionally has been is the building being occupied you've got a number of okay. buildings that are multi-tenant buildings and in some markets, the demand for federal space has declined and, uh, and there may be other factors where the building is not fully utilized. So I think that's one lens that the government has used in terms of how well am I using the space? And if the space is vacant or if it's underutilized, then I should probably do something differently. The other factor that is now coming more into the conversation, and I think it's the right question to ask, it's not just a question of space utilization, it's also a question of highest and best use. So okay. they have a space that is fully occupied, uh, but you may be sitting on prime property where government use of that space may not be highest and best use. So I think what the federal government is now realizing is that, okay, you know, there's a way to kind of capitalize under, on the underlying value of the asset. There may be multiple ways of meeting the agency housing requirement. You, it's if you're in an own space in a prime real estate market, do you have to be in that own space? Can you go rent space and can you capitalize on the underlying value of that? And I think the Volpe uh, example in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the government had 14 acres in Kendall Square. And for those who are, of you who are familiar with Kendall Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts, prime real estate. The government okay. recognized that it didn't need all 14 acres. It got rid of 11 of those 14 acres and got $750 million worth of value through that transaction. <laughs> so that, that reminds me of, they, the, I, I live in Santa Monica, the U.S. Post Office here in Santa Monica sold, I want to say last year, so that, that sounds about right with exactly what you're saying, prime real estate right in the downtown market. Is other that, another not, question. I just oh, had a, a question for Norm. That's not necessarily typical, though, 
the government's been rather laxed or not very ambitious to sell government owned properties. Although you had a major transaction when you were commissioner uh, with Google, which I thought was pretty fascinating. I don't know if you want to share a brief uh, you know, description as to what took place there. I thought that was pretty fascinating, Norm. I think the headline here is, you know, the government is finally realizing that federal use may not be highest and best use. And as, you know, resources are growing increasingly tight, how do you kind of make the most of your assets, recognizing that just because you're using it doesn't mean that you should keep it? And there may be alternate ways of meeting the housing requirement and allowing you at the same time to tap into that underlying value. Nice. A question came in. Pros and cons about having your property leased by a government agency. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll start with that. So, um, well, certainly the pros are the, the certainty of income stream, you know, the flight to quality, if you will. Uh, there really is no better credit in the world than the federal government. So there's a, there's a real demand for those assets because, you know, you, you're assured you're going to get that, that check every month. Uh, but it, it, uh, it requires, a lot more intense management and operation um, by the landlord. Government tends to be pretty demanding and they expect a um, pretty immediate response to tend to any issues that surface. So I think just briefly, that's, that's the pro. And then the, you know, the con probably is, is that these are fully serviced you know, gross leases and the landlord is responsible for taking care of all the maintenance and services to, to the asset. So just briefly, I think that's a, a pretty good overview. Unless Norm, you have something to add. Yeah, I'll just share one example that uh, is common in federal leases, but you don't see it uh, at other uh, in private sector leases. And that is what I would say lease term strategy where the government demands flexibility that it rarely uses. So when you've got a government lease, you'll have what's known as the firm term, where the government is committed for that firm period of time, but then you'll have a soft term. So you might have a 10 year firm lease with another five years that are soft term where the government can cancel with either 90 or 120 days notice uh, during the course of that soft term period. And rarely is it exercised, but it creates a lot of uncertainty on the part of the owner and you know, it creates complications in terms of financing. So you know, it's having left GSA and kind of continuing to see GSA focus on uh, these soft term requirements. It, to me, it's the government requiring flexibility that it doesn't use and ends up costing the government more in the long run. Very good point. Interesting. No, I, I, I assumed the uh, guaranteed rent check, if you will, but didn't think about the other, the other aspect of that too. And, and, and kind of, you know, not necessarily switching topics, but talking about what's going on today with, with COVID-19, how have, I guess a couple, you know, it's a, it's a big question on PAC, but what was the impact you guys would, assume has happened so far on government commercial real estate um in particularly i guess with my, my biggest thing is just assuming that a lot of people are remote maybe not everyone's remote still but you know that is that gonna you know look at more or less space down the road or how how will that affect things to start there maybe why don't i take that question then greg i'll let you answer the facilities management aspect of this but i think what we're seeing right now is we kind of talked about those factors at play. Um, the jury's still out in terms of, you know, what we'll see in the future for government real estate. And I think, you know, the pandemic has forced governments at all levels, whether it's federal, state, or local, to take a hard look at their space requirements and what they will need in the post-pandemic effort and era. You know, we talked about the telework proof of concept. We talked about the de-densification of the workplace. Uh, another question is what type of HVAC standards uh, will be warranted in the post-pandemic era. So 
there's a lot of kind of real estate and facilities management soul searching going on in terms of what this post pandemic era will hold. But I want to also talk about the fiscal impact and draw a distinction between what we're seeing at the federal level versus the state and local level. At the federal level, we haven't seen much of a fiscal impact and it seems like the space projects continue. They may be slowing down as people kind of are giving additional thought to the longer term space requirement, but the activity itself is continuing. At the state and local level, it's a slightly different story. And I think the contrast there is that, all right, when you think about the economic downturn and the impact on government budgets, at the state and local level, revenues are down. By law, they have to balance their budgets. So what you're seeing is belt tightening across the state and local landscape as governments are forced to balance their budget. And yeah, it is kind of impacting some of the project activity that we're seeing. At the federal level, you know, as I said in the beginning, we just passed the $6 trillion mark in terms of spending at the federal level. So there's not that same type of dynamic. So you're seeing kind of less of an impact in terms of the project activity across the federal government. Yeah, it's really going to be interesting to see. And it's, it's not going to happen overnight. I know that the, the executives with GSA, VA, and other agencies are assessing all this, the impact of the pandemic and what, what that all means uh, to operating buildings. Agencies are, are different. The disinfection, the disinfectants that are required now. Uh, GSA just uh, initiated a unilateral decision to require more disinfecting, more frequent, um, a list of products that are, are pages long. How do you determine what you're going to use? So it's a, it's a, it's a dilemma. It's a, it's a challenge for the landlords to make sure that they're doing what the, the government wants in terms of dis disinfecting. And when it comes to agencies, many agencies have a lot of foot traffic, a lot of people coming in and out. And so the demands to provide um, disinfectants for, for occupancy use like that is, is uh, much more than it would be otherwise if there's a, a lot less traffic. So they're really figuring that stuff out. And um, it, it's obviously become very important. They engaged in this initiative uh, quickly just to make sure that employees and those that the visitors were, were protected. So that, that's kind of a big one in terms of operations. It'll be interesting also to see in terms of if, if the, the use declines, then there's not as much use uh, with employees. Maybe they're gonna work on a reduced hourly, you know, they could take off a Friday or reduce hours per day. What will happen to utilities and electricity? Will those go down? So I think there's a lot of things that we're, we're not quite sure what's gonna happen. Um, and when it comes to the government, other than initiating the, you know, making sure that the premises were clean and disinfected properly, um, you know, some of these things take a while to, to really root out. You know, an, another question that comes to my mind, how do you see or what would you envision from government regulations and their building requirements? Like, how will that trickle down to the private sector? Because Norm, you mentioned with like HVAC and, and Greg, you on the disinfectant and things like that. Is that is that kind of how the rules and regulations will be pushed out? Kind of what they're doing is going to be the gold standard? I think folks are still trying to figure it out. I think right okay. now what you're seeing is that folks are asking the question. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's facilities management standards and janitorial and cleaning standards that Greg was talking about, or whether it's HVAC standards, or whether it's just kind of uh, design standards in terms of, all right, should we be spreading people out or should we continue to pack them in like we have in the past? I think right now everything is on the table. It's hard to say which way will those, this will go, but my sense is that people recognize that, all right, now is the time to take a hard look at all of these questions because when we're making space and facilities decisions, we're making those decisions for the longer term. So let's try mm -hmm. to write. One of the things that I, uh, I'll just insert here is, is that uh, NFDA as an association and having relationships with uh, at GSA and other agency leaders, um, I, you know, really gives the NFDA a voice and then it gives government a voice to the private sector, private industry. Uh, they, they under Dan Matthews and, and Norm previously, under their um, leadership, they encouraged 
federal government to speak to private sector, to learn more. And so it's been a back and forth learning experience. And so I think that there'll be a lot of that that will uh, occur in the future to work out these um, issues uh, in a collaborative uh, manner. Interesting. Very, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with that, that that's for sure. Um, we had a question come in. Is, is it true that government landlords have to rebid for a government lease once the lease is up for renewal? An example, if the lease is five years, once the lease is up, the landlord has to compete with other landlords to keep the tenant. I think you know, there's something known as the Competition and Contracting Act, where as you have a requirement, whether it's a lease requirement uh, or whether it's another type of contract, where it's the principle of full and open competition that applies. And just because you, know, you may have a lease uh, that goes for like 10 or 15 years, but as that lease comes due for expiration, the government is required to uh, run the competitive process to make sure that at the end of the day, it's a fair and reasonable and competitive deal. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that uh, the government will will move at the you know during that process, and I think there are a lot of factors to consideration, including move and replication costs. Uh, but uh, the basic concept is that it needs to be a fair and level playing field uh, as those leases come due for expiration. Interesting. Okay, so another question came up, and this is this is a pretty granular one, um, asking. He has a client wanting to purchase a VA facility. The VA is in the second year of their second five-year term. My client would like to seek before purchasing if the VA would extend or renew now for another five years, total of eight years. The question being, is this a consideration and an effort willing to explore prior to purchasing or will the VA only renew under the terms of the six months prior to expir uh, expiration? That might be a little too detailed for you guys. But... <laughs> Why don't we set up an opportunity to connect offline on that one? Just Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. We'll do that. that that's a good idea. Um, so, <laughs> sometimes you got to unpack them. That, that was <laughs> that one was that was written out very well. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> we'll be sure to connect you guys. Um, okay. So switching gears a little bit. Obviously, with um, what was on the television last night with the debate. How do election years play into government commercial real estate needs? And I'm assuming that this election year with what's going on and with the pandemic uh, may be a little bit different than what you all have seen. I'll go well, ahead and get intimately in that process. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, GSA has about 8,000 leases, as Greg mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And uh, each year, about a thousand of those leases come due for expiration. So what you're seeing is that the need for government real estate is a continuous function that isn't going to stop uh, to consider the uh, the election cycle. And le leases come due for expiration, as we were just talking about, and they need to be renewed or replaced. Uh, and new space requirements continue to move forward, whether they're owned or leased space. So is that so? Basically, the the system keeps moving along and is not going to slow down uh, in any any significant way. Just to kind of figure out to read the tea leaves of the election. I would say there's an exception, and that would be for large, high value or high profile projects uh, that are new and somewhat controversial or somewhat complex. And I think an example would be like the FBI headquarters consolidation here in Washington, D.C. Or under the last administration, uh, there was a consideration of uh, exchanging the Department of Labor headquarters building for a new facility. So those are a little bit more high profile, more complex, potentially more controversial, where I think the, uh, the government uh, would be more willing to kind of pause uh, to allow the incoming administration to to weigh in if there is a change in administration. But by and large, you see the data acti the day to day activity continuing to roll forward. So what what happens uh, norm when a new administration comes in? 
as I understand it, uh, the uh, president and uh, his administration determines if they're going to retain the existing GSA commissioner for public building services or other leadership within the uh, the government that handles these leases and whatnot. Uh, yeah, what yeah. I think with, with any political position, the incoming administration uh, reserves the right to uh, name leadership to each of those positions. So more or less, because this question came in, if there is a political change, it could impact the government lease market based on what, if that, as that change happens, you'd say? Mm. I, I think it's too early to say. You know, I, too early to say, okay. I, I don't think just because you have a change in leadership, I mean, that suggests that you'll have a dramatic change in strategy and approach. And I mentioned kind of the freeze the footprint, uh, the reduce the footprint, mm -hmm that's been going on uh, over the past decade that has transcended administrations and has had support from both Republicans and Democrats. So I think, relatively speaking, there seems to be more consensus on uh, the issues related to managing the federal real estate portfolio more uh, effectively. So just because, you know, if you were to see a change in administration, that doesn't necessarily entail uh, a redirection of focus and energy. Interesting. Okay. It, this is this is more or less a crystal ball question for me, but you know the chart that, that you guys were showing earlier. It, it seemed that after any type, well, after you know 2000, 2008 to two thousand twelve, there was an increase overall that came with the, the federal spending of square footage being used. Do you, do you think that that would happen and this time as well, just with, you know, down the road, the next year, two years, three years, will it continue to increase as it has in the past? Hmm. Norm. Let me make sure I understand your question. My son was just in the kitchen distracting me. Uh, <laughs> the joys of working from home. <laughs> Are you saying, should we expect to see an increase in the federal footprint going forward? Yeah, I think that, yeah, just in, in regards to, you know, how the chart looked historically, would you think that that would continue to happen going forward, being in a somewhat of a downturn, one would think, all things considered, not looking at the stock market right now, but everything else? Hmm. Well, there's certain agencies that, uh, but for different reasons, perhaps, like uh, Veterans Administration with the community-based outpatient clinics, Congress's has uh, allocated a lot of funds in that direction. But overall, you would think, Norm, that, um, that you would continue on this path of uh, reduce the footprint? Yeah, you know, I think you're seeing different factors at play. The reduce the footprint effort will undoubtedly continue. Granted, we talked about those uh, more focused expansions in federal functions, particularly those around the public health, health. activities that we talked about before. Uh, and another factor to consider is, okay, we kind of go in cycles here in terms of government spending. Uh, we've been in an expansive mode uh, over the past few years, just as we were after 2008, 2009. And back in 2008, 2009, you saw spending begin to crest and then kind of begin to diminish. You had uh, sequestration, you had a focused effort government-wide to do a lot of belt tightening. So I think we've kind of seen cycles of activities where you see spending increase, but then folks recognize that you can't continue or sustain this path forever and that you need to kind of dial back spending. So the question is, where are we in that cycle? That, that makes sense, absolutely. Um, so I, I know we're getting close to time here with the top of the hour. Um, question that, that uh, I wanted to bring up because we do have a lot of brokers tuning in typically. What advice would you share with brokers looking to engage with the government public sector clients overall? And I, I think you guys have uh, you've seen a lot of different things over the years, I'm assuming. So it might be different now than it was before. Boy. Um, yeah, let me, let me start that out. Um, well, I, I, I've been in the business and investment sales for, what, 41 years now. Um, I started to work on government lease properties in, in terms of sales about 25 years ago. And how it started for me was I had uh, some clients that had built 
uh, bill of suits, if you will, for the, for the government, state and federal um, in Northern California at the time. And um, they reached out to me to um, provide uh, uh, an opportunity to, to sell that property. And uh, fortunately we were successful and it just kind of entered me into an, a new arena, if you will, um, that oh, okay. is quite unique. It's quite a, a niche as, as large as the space is uh, in the United States, given that they're the largest uh, tenant, if you will, in the country, maybe the world, I'm not sure, that um, it, is, it is unique, uh, notwithstanding. So that's kind of how I entered in, into it. I had the investment experience, but not necessarily dealing with this kind of a, an asset. And these, these properties that I at least started out with were, were single tenant. They were 100% okay. occupied. They did have long-term leases at the time, which made a big difference. So that's just, I suppose, one way of getting into it. The other way is, is uh, well, I learned a lot more when I became uh, a member of NFDA back in 2010, attended conferences, reached out to uh, the network of members that, that were in the association, um, brokers and developers and investors and contractors, architects, property managers, financiers, all those. And so you just learn more and more and you get connected with the people that are in that space. So whether that, uh, as opposed to going on into a, a real elaborate discussion about it, I, I, I think that hopefully that just gives somebody the, you know, an understanding of what might be the best way to, to include it and add it to their, you know, their method of operation, their, their, their business model, carve out, you know, maybe some time, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but carve out some time to, to, to learn. You know, one quick question I have on that, because I know that you're outside of Sacramento and Norm, you're in DC. Does location have anything to, to play in this, in this factor as well? Well, I, um, I, I, that has not been a limitation um, with government lease properties as, as well okay. as not with triple net lease properties that are located all over the United States. Um, even exactly. inspecting the facilities aren't necessarily required. Many of the buildings I, I sell um, certainly are not located near me and I don't necessarily visit them. Uh, the buyers typically do, but, but not necessarily. Uh, they they okay. engage third party services to you know, do a study of the property and, and the building and the, the facilities. But um, so it's not really a, a limitation for, for me. I just want to add one additional thought on your earlier question, and I think just to pick up on what Greg was saying, it's important to understand the mechanics of the process. That's a given, whether we're talking about the GSA leasing process or the particular procedures of any given state or local jurisdiction where you're considering focusing your effort. But I think you need to look beyond the actual mechanics of the leasing process and the procurement process to understand kind of like the different players involved and at the federal level it's not just gsa it's also uh federal tenant agencies it's the office of management budget it's congress as well as other key stakeholders so you got to understand kind of who are the stakeholders who are influencing these decisions about uh federal real estate projects and you have to understand how the planning process takes months and months if not years before an actual request for lease proposal gets issued. So I think it's, yeah, you got to understand the policies and procedures, but you got to understand the decision-making structure and the dynamic within and among these different entities. You've got to get to know the individual players and you've got to understand how decisions get made within that complex network. Yeah, I, I'm assuming it, that's, uh, that's a big portion of it. The process is probably very, very important in this when you're, when that's your client, who you're dealing with or your tenant, I should say. Um, no, it makes sense. We, you know, we're, we're at the top, we're, we're a little over time here, but I definitely want to just um, say real quickly, there are, there are a few individuals that want to reach out to you gentlemen uh, offline. So we'll, we'll definitely share everyone's contact information um, who, who requested that. And um, yeah, I mean, the last, last question I have for you gentlemen, I, I usually ask it every time it's, it's completely off topic here, but um you know, I, I, do you do you guys like to read a physical book? Do you listen to podcasts? Are you more of an audible person? I, I always just I'm just curious, and I got to ask if there's anything in particular you'd share with the audience here that you're into right now. Uh, what you'd recommend there? <laughs> I'm old school. I read. I'm reading a hardcover book right now. 
Uh, I like it. On the presidency of all topics. Um, but I, <laughs> a lot of people listen to podcasts. Matt, I know that you're a runner. Uh, I, I never understood mm -hmm. runners could listen to podcasts. I got to listen to music when I'm running. <laughs> oh Hi. gosh, I, I'm pretty old school as well. Um, I like to I like to pick up a paperback or a hardback myself and and read and um, underline or you know put put notes in the margins, what have you. Um, but you know I do I do pick up and and read a lot on the computer or on the iPhone like uh, most people do today. But uh, I I haven't read I haven't read a book on uh, on the computer. I don't know if I'll get there. Well, well, gentlemen, I, I really appreciate the time today. Um, we had a lot of good questions from the audience. They were very engaged too. So we, we really appreciate you, um, you know, bringing your knowledge to the table. I feel like it's a very timely discussion with, with what's going on. And um, yeah, I wanted to thank everybody for, from joining us uh, as well from across the country today. We, we really appreciate the time and, and um, thanks everyone for coming. Any, any last minute comments you wanted to uh, share with anybody out there, gentlemen, please feel free to, um, and, and we'll share their information. So anyone who did want to reach out, we can share everyone's information as well. Well, just thanks everybody for uh, participating. Hopefully it was informative. Um, I, I thank Norm so much because uh, clearly he understands this space um, intimately and has been with the government uh, in various positions. And so thank you, Norm, and thanks for not charging for your, <laughs> your time. <laughs> I enjoyed the conversation today. <laughs> A lot of fun. Yeah. Good. Yes. No, this is great, guys. Thanks so much. Um, we will sign off now, but it'll be live. Or, I'm sorry, it'll be available uh, on our blog, on our YouTube channel, and we will send a link out to everybody as well uh, who joined today um, with, that they'll have it in the next probably two days uh, once it's all finished. Great. Thanks again. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs>